Hey, you guys, Erin here, back with another moon update for you. We're going to be talking about this solar eclipse we've got coming up here on Saturday, October 14th. This is a new moon. Anytime that we have a solar eclipse, we have to be having a new moon, okay? What it means is when we have a new moon, of course, we have a new moon every single month. And what it means is the sun and the moon are both in the exact same spot, okay? When we have a solar eclipse, the sun and the moon are in the same spot, but either the north or the south node will be right next to the sun and the moon. And that's what creates the eclipse, okay? So this is a south node solar eclipse in the sign of Libra. The new moon peaks at 10.55 a.m. Pacific time. Now, of course, because this is a new moon, this is still a time to manifest new beginnings or growth that is related to the sign of Libra. But this is also because this is a south node solar eclipse. The south node is like a drain point that brings celestial energy out. So it's kind of like a trippy blend of energies that are going on here. Basically, what's going to happen is the sun and the moon will be in the same exact spot. And over, let's see, it'll be about over eight hours the this moon will transit over the south node, which drains energy out as well. So this is an interesting one to interpret here, but eclipses are very, very powerful, okay? Now, this particular new moon takes place at 21 degrees Libra. So with that said, if you have anything in your natal chart near 21 degrees Libra or opposing that at 21 degrees Aries or maybe squaring that at 21 degrees Cancer or Capricorn, and it doesn't specifically have to be at 21 degrees. I'd say basically anything between 19 and say 23 degrees at those points in your natal chart or even trining this, say between 18 and 23 degrees uh, in Gemini or Aquarius. This is a very, very powerful solar eclipse and new moon for you, okay? Basically what this means is, I mean, really for everybody, of course, we all experience this as a collective, but it's going to manifest uniquely for each and every one of us. Even if you don't have anything at those points in your chart, you still somewhere in your natal chart lays the sign of Libra, okay? It's really beneficial to get familiar with your natal chart so you can know which area of your life this is specifically manifesting through, which house in your natal chart does the sign of Libra come through? Okay, that will tell you what area of your life something is being drained out, okay? And really this sign, sorry, the South Node is going through the sign of Libra all the way until January of 2026. So we're all like kind of, there's a little bit of a drain going on through this sign of Libra. Now don't be nervous, Libras. That doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Could be taking something out of your life that you don't need anymore. It's something that's not serving you, okay? And what I like to do, is really work with my intentions. As some of you know, I pull out my journal, I write down what I want to manifest that I know is in alignment with the new moons, the full moons, really anything astrological, but very specifically for eclipse, uh, eclipse season. If I know it's a south node eclipse, I'm like, okay, so this is something that's being drained out of my life. Where does the sign of Libra fall in my natal chart? Do we have any planets in the sign of Libra? I align this specifically to my natal chart. And of course, if that's too much for you, I just want to say this. we It's really important to learn astrology in baby steps. And not everybody has time to learn all the little details of astrology. So if that's too much for you, that's perfectly okay. Just focus on the sign of Libra and think about what do you want to let go of that is related to this sign of Libra. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this recording is A, I'm going to break down the sign of Libra for you so you know what you're working with here. I'm also going to be pulling up the chart and showing you other very prominent astrological forces that we're receiving around the time of this solar eclipse. And I will also be talking about certain parts of the body that are ruled by the sign of Libra because these parts of our body become more sensitive when the moon transits through the sign of Libra, but especially when it's a new moon or a full moon, and especially, especially when it's an eclipse in the sign of Libra. So of course, I will also be mentioning some potential herbal remedies to help support these parts of our bodies. And of course, as usual, I will be pulling up some gemstones that resonate well with the sign of Libra and really just some overall gemstones that are beneficial for this kind of transit. Okay, so this sign of Libra, first of all, this is what we call the cardinal air sign. 
by cardinal, what I mean is that this energy has force, okay? Sign of Libra. It's a really interesting energy too. Yes, it comes with force, but Libra is also a very chill, laid back energy. I'll get into that. But first, let's talk about the fact that it's in the element of air. Okay. The element of air has a lot to do with intellect. Okay. The sign of Libra is definitely associated with intellectual energies here, but a lot of that has to do with like balancing things out and making sense of things, kind of being logical about things. Okay. So Libra is ruled by Venus, the influencer of love. This sign of Libra is a very, very charming energy. I do have this, like, I'm magnetically drawn to Libra risings or just Libra energy, period, because it's just this super charming energy. And I do feel strongly that the A has a lot to do with the fact that it comes with force. Again, it's cardinal, but it's also ruled by Venus, okay, this influencer of love and balance and harmony. It's like basically Venus is this energy of when everybody's just getting along. There's a bunch of beautiful people together. And I don't necessarily mean that they're uh, physically beautiful. I mean, it's just beautiful on the inside. That's what I mean by beauty. Okay, just laid back and having a good time. But this Libra energy, it's really the sign of relationships. Okay, the sign of partnerships. And what I see, this cardinal energy coming through with this sign of Libra, because the other cardinal signs tend to be a little more, a little more forceful, a little more projective. Okay. But this sign of Libra, where I notice that force coming through is when they are say at a gathering, a, an event where there's a lot of people around this sign of Libra. And this doesn't mean that every single person who's a Libra is going to be like this because there's so much more to the natal chart. But when somebody's got a heavy dose of Libra energy in their natal chart, again, especially like Libra risings. And then if they've got say Mercury or Mars or something in their first house, I notice that this Libra energy projects with force when it wants to introduce itself to somebody and will come up and just be like, hi, how are you? Because it's the sign of you and another person, okay? It definitely could be very strongly associated with your romantic partner, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Okay, now the sign of Libra, it's represented by the scales, okay? It's all about balance, balancing things out. In fact, the motto for the sign of Libra is I balance. It has a lot to do with fairness and justice. A lot of people who've got a heavy dose of Libra energy in their natal chart, fairness and justice is very, very important to them. I notice a lot of people with their sun in Libra. I mean, this is not necessarily only for people with their sun in Libra, but this Libra energy has a very tough time. Obviously, we don't live in a very fair world. There's a lot of really unfair and unjust things that go on. And this sign of Libra really doesn't like that. In fact, a lot of people who have their sun in Libra or their Libra rising, or if they've got Libra coming through their 10th house, or they've got their midheaven in the sign of Libra, I notice that they're drawn to positions of, say, being an officer or working in the so-called justice department, in my opinion, is that we don't have a justice department. In fact, I think we've got an injustice department. But these people want to go into that kind of system, but because they want to do the good thing. Like I know a lot of Libra, I've got quite a bit of Libra energy in my own natal chart. Some of this some of you guys might not know this about me, but I actually got my degree in criminal justice law enforcement many, many years ago because I wanted to go into that kind of field. If I really am being honest here, I wanted to go into being an animal control officer, and they're very strongly associated with uh, law enforcement. But I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted things to be fair for people. If I, in fact, I very strongly considered. There's a long story behind this, but I almost was going to work for the sheriff's department. I was looking forward to potentially becoming a deputy. I ended up earned, injuring myself pretty severely and couldn't follow through with that. And hallelujah, I didn't because I love what I do now. But anyway, it was like, I wanted to be the good cop. I wanted to be the one that brings the fairness and the justice for the people. And a lot of people who have this Libra energy in their natal chart, they're drawn to that type of career because they want justice, they want fairness, but also about this sign of Libra, some of these people, it's like 50-50, they either wanna go into some field of like working in a justice department or they're drawn to being in front of a camera. A lot of actors and actresses are either Libra sun or they've got Libra in their the house of career. I'm talking about the 10th house or the midheaven that is directly associated with career. Okay. A lot of people have Libra up there at the top of the chart, 
they want to be actors or actresses because they are very charming and they do very well in front of a camera. Okay, so there's that. This sign of Libra is absolutely lovely. I will say this though, the sun is considered a little debilitated in the sign of Libra. And let me explain to you why. Because the sun, let me put it to you this way. The sign of Aries is the sign of self. And the sun exalts in the sign of Aries. That's where the sun works with its greatest strength because Aries is the sign of self. It's cardinal fire and it's the warrior of the zodiac, okay? It's all about self. That's why the sun, the brightest light in the sky, works with so much immense strength in the sign of Aries. Now, if Aries is over here, Libra's over here, they're opposite in the zodiac, okay? So, in fact, Aries represents when the sun is rising, when the day is beginning. Libra, on the other hand, is about balance and the sign of other people, you know, another person, you're sharing your energy with somebody. So the sun is like, well, you know, okay, I don't get to be all about myself here. I don't get to have self willpower here. That doesn't mean the people who are Libra don't have self willpower because, again, there's so much more to the natal chart. But the sun is technically setting when we think about the sign of Libra. In fact, the glyph for the sign of Libra really does show the sun setting. Now, this is a beautiful energy. This is like when we go, you know, say you have a new romantic partner, everybody loves to go watch a sunset with their romantic partner because it's beautiful and it's charming, but that's where the sun is going down. That's where the sun is in its fall is what it's called. The sun in Libra is in its fall. Okay, so it's beautiful and charming and fair and balanced and all these wonderful things, but it's not necessarily the most willpower kind of energy. In fact, some people who have a lot of Libra energy in their natal chart might even have a tendency to be a little bit lazy. Like that's the energy of the sun going down. Okay, it's time to go inside. It's time to have a glass of wine. It's time to chill. The sign of Libra could be very, very chill. My very best friend from early, early childhood is a Libra. And I absolutely love that about her. Okay, so there's that. Let's go ahead. Oh, and by the way, so let's go back to this. How do you want to grow in these ways? How do you want to grow? Because this is a new moon in the sign of Libra. This is what I do. I pull out my journal. I write down what kind of growth I want to experience that's related to this sign of Libra. So let's say you want growth in your relationship. And this doesn't necessarily only apply to your romantic partner, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever it is. Okay. It doesn't necessarily just only apply to that. It certainly is very strongly associated with that. Let's say you've got a new partner and you want this relationship to grow into something even more beautiful. Write that down in your journal. Or at least, I mean, personally, I do think you're going to have your greatest success. You're going to see the best results by writing this stuff down. But if you just absolutely are somebody who's not going to do that, then envision it in your head, especially in the hours leading up to this new moon. You want this relationship to grow, or you want to manifest more justice in the world, more fairness into your life. Let's say there's, let's say you're in a relationship and your partner's uh, self-absorbed and not giving you enough attention. Write that down. I am manifesting that this person, you know, shows a fair amount of attention to me as well. Or if you just want to manifest more charm, you want to be more charming, you can write that down as well. Or if you want to go into, you know, acting or that sort of thing. Again, in fact, the sign of Libra can even be associated with things like art because it has so much to do with beauty and harmony. Okay. So how do you want to grow in these ways? And I'll go into that South Node transit when I pull up the chart. Let's pull up the chart right now. Okay, so for those of you who are new to my recordings, I work with geocentric Western astrology. And with that said, what we're looking at here is a snapshot of the tropical zodiac at the time of this new moon. And the way it works is, again, with geocentric, we've got Earth right here in the middle of this thing. Okay, so here we are. These symbols right here are all the celestial bodies, like here's Venus, over here is Mercury, here's the moon, here's the sun, here's Mars, down here is Pluto, over here is Saturn, over here is Neptune. Okay, when we go in the wheel a little way, these are the symbols for the zodiac signs that all these things will be beaming through onto us at the time of this new moon. And I will point this out as well. I'm This is based on my location here in Santa Cruz, California. Here's the sun. Here's the moon. For everybody on earth, the sun and the moon will be at 21 degrees Libra. Here's the symbol for Libra, okay? 
But if you live in other parts of the world, let's say you live over in the UK or whatever, then the sun and the moon are all, they're going to be down here. Okay. But they'll still be at 21 degrees Libra. Or if you're over in the East coast, they'll be somewhere over here, but still be at 21 degrees Libra. So again, we all experience this as a collective, but also as individuals. And here, right, here's a little bit of a, a larger version of this. It's technically called a glyph, but we'll call it symbols. Okay, this is the symbol or the glyph for the sign of Libra. When you look at that, the horizontal line, that's to represent the horizon. And this guy right here, that little bump, that's the sun setting. At least that's what I have been taught. I don't, I didn't make the symbol, so I can't say for sure. Okay, but it does make sense. All right, so... <clears throat> Again, anytime we have a new moon, it means the sun and the moon are both at the exact same spot. And again, this takes place at 10.55 a.m. Pacific time. So first of all, again, this is, it's like the moon is the mother, the sun is the father in Western astrology. The mother and the father have come together to create this energetic baby. And over these six months, we'll all be experiencing this opportunity for this Libran growth okay so that's why we write this down what kind of growth you want to experience that's related to the sign of libra and in the 21 degrees here we're in the third deacon so this is our decan either way it doesn't matter how you pronounce it at least i've heard the decans being pronounced decans and deacons i don't know which one's precisely accurate uh, but what this means is we are in that the last 10 degrees of that Libra energy. So it's actually a little twist of Gemini energy as well, which Gemini is a little more adaptable kind of energy is strongly associated with communication. Okay, so there's that. Now, should I get into the South Node now? Let's do it. Okay, so this right here is the South Node. If any of you guys have been watching my videos for a while, you know how much I love to talk about these nodes. <laughs> The other day, my brother said something like, Aaron, just no more node talk. I don't want to hear any more about the nodes. <laughs> it's hilarious because these are my favorite thing to talk about. Okay, the south node, that's the drain point. Okay, that's where the celestial tides go out. So with that said, that's what's making this an eclipse. Okay, now what we see is the south node is actually at 24 degrees Libra. And what I was talking about, here's the moon at 10.55 a.m. Pacific time. Well, I think it's going to be somewhere around 6.30 p.m. Pacific time because the moon's going to move along. Here's the moon. The moon will go tick, 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 tick as the day progresses and will transit right on over that south node. Okay, so it's almost like kind of pulling some of this energy out and really this south node is going to be in the sign of libra all the way until january of 2025 so if you have anything prominent in your natal chart in the sign of libra that south node is trying to tr whatever let's say you've got mercury at uh 20 degrees libra Le uh, mercury has so much to do with our mental function it has a huge impact on our, our our consciousness on our on our conscious awareness okay and logic and that sort of thing so if that south node if you've got mercury in libra and that south node transits over your mercury it's almost a your communication skills might not be mercury also has a huge influence on our communication skills your communication skills and your mental function might not be so optimal at the time uh but at the same at that same time it's like it's trying to pull something out it's trying to make room for something new to come into your mind or some kind of new uh communication skills and that happens over time as we move forward through this eclipse energy okay but overall the south node draining something out through the sign of libra and e again even if you don't have anything in your natal chart in the sign of libra you're still if you pull up your natal chart you're going to find one of these little slices of pie okay those are the houses that really are areas of our life where things manifest and everybody's got libra somewhere in their natal chart <clears throat> could be coming through your house of career and maybe it's time for a new career the uh, south node is draining something out of your career maybe it's going through your house of communication skills and draining something out through the communication in your life or maybe it's going through your your house of physical health and potentially even like losing weight or or getting rid of something that you used to be addicted to eating and it's time to let, let go of that if it's in your sixth house or maybe even in your second house your house of money this potentially could be draining out the way you've been making your money the way you value your money trying to take something out of that so again it's 
A, I'm, I am teaching a, a course where, let's see, we're about halfway through the courses. I, some of you maybe heard me mention this <clears throat> through the Academy for Astrological Medicine. I am teaching a series of six classes to teach people how to read their own natal chart, not just their own, but anybody's natal chart, okay? And uh, you can sign up for those classes through the Academy for Astrological Medicine. We've been meeting every single Monday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, but some people can't make the live call. So you get access, lifetime access to all the recordings, okay? And it's actually very, very affordable. If, again, if I'll leave a link. If you go to the Academy for Astrological Medicine.com, you'll see that series of classes and then, you can learn this stuff for yourself so you understand better what I'm trying to teach you guys here. This is literally my favorite thing to do is to teach you guys how to do this stuff for yourself. Of course, I love giving readings and telling you about your chart yourself, but more than anything, I love it when people want to learn this stuff for themselves. It's so exciting. Okay, so there's that. Now, eclipses in general <clears throat> are very, very powerful, okay? The south node is considered the dragon's tail. Okay, over here is the North Node. That's the dragon's head. That's where energy comes in. In fact, a few weeks from now, we're going to have a, a, a lunar eclipse, a North Node lunar eclipse in the sign of Aries. That will be bringing energy in, okay? this But this South Node, the dragon's tail, also referred to as Ketu, that it's the dragon's tail that can be kind of ferocious and whip things around, okay? And in fact, the real Hindu le legend behind these guys, behind the North and the South Node, is that they're considered enemies of the sun and the moon, okay? Now I'm trying to debate if I wanna go into this or not. Let's go into it. This video is gonna be long and I apologize. Okay, so the legend goes that Lord Vishnu was going around handing out potion for eternal life. It's called the Amrita. And, but this potion is only specific for specific gods who are meant to have eternal life. So he's going around passing around this potion. Well. A demon, which has over time been changed into a dragon, okay, but the original story, at least from my understanding, was a demon, came up and stole the Amrita, stole the potion for eternal life, drank a bunch of it, and then the sun and the moon, they caught him. They caught the demon who stole the Amrita, okay, so they got him, the sun and the moon did, they bring him back to Lord Vishnu, so we, we got the demon who and they already drank some of the potion, so now he's got an eternal life. Well, as punishment, Lord Vishnu cut the demon's head off. Okay, now that this right here, it still has eternal life. It's just two different entities now. It's an it's an aggressive two different entities because it's a little angry that it got a head's head cut off. But regardless, and again, this is over time somehow been changed into a dragon. Um, but so that is why this is the dragon's tail and this is the dragon's head. And that's why they're considered enemies of the sun and the moon because they caught him. Okay, so that, and when we have an eclipse, it means in some way, shape or form, it depends on what kind of eclipse it is, whether it's solar eclipse, lunar eclipse, it means <clears throat> that the sun and the moon are, we'll just use the word aligned with or right next to either the north or the south node, or if it's a lunar eclipse, they're both the sun is next to the north node or the sun is next to the south node and the moon is next to the north node or the moon is next to the south node. Sorry, this is probably going way over some people's heads, but that's why eclipses are kind of considered, <clears throat> I'm just going to say, it, they're kind of considered a little bit of a dangerous time. It is not recommended that we go out and especially visually expose ourselves to eclipses there's very rare things that can if you are really really tapped into astrology and you know your chart really well and you'd be able to see like oh wait a minute here this is actually a really good eclipse for me okay maybe might want to expose yourself i i just per prefer not to do it um and in fact the one time i did the one time i did this is before i knew what i know now uh I went out, it was the, the great American eclipse in 2017 in the sign of Leo. Okay. I was not, I just knew eclipses were magical, which they are certainly, but I was not aware of exactly, you know, the whole legend behind them and that sort of thing. Well, I went out and I went to, to a, uh, it was like a little waterfall spring fairly close to where I live. And I went out there and I put my feet in the spring water and I, you know, said my prayers and really tapped into the mysticism behind it all and that sort of thing. 
Well, almost immediately after the eclipse, because I went out there specifically during the time of the eclipse, almost immediately, I had terrible anxiety, like for the entire rest of the day. And I'm not somebody who deals with anxiety. I worry about everything, but I'm not an anxious person. Like I'm not like a, a don't, that's something I just don't have in my nail chart. I don't deal with anxiety, but boy, oh boy, did I have anxiety that day. It was gnarly. And I didn't really, I didn't think much about it. I was just like, oh, something's going on. I don't feel right. Uh, and then after reading so much about eclipses, a lot of the information that I have on eclipses is coming from a couple of Judith Hill's books, Eclipses and You is a fantastic book, but there's also The Lunar Nodes, Your Key to Excellent Chart Interpretation. Those are really good books to help you understand exactly what these nodes are and why eclipses. It's, I mean, in ancient times, certain cultures would go out and bang pots. They'd literally break pots going when we're leading into an eclipse because they felt that by banging the pots or breaking the pots, they're breaking something needs to be broken by an eclipse something needs to be taken out of your life or something aggressive is going to come in and so they would break these pots to kind of like that is what broke instead of something in my environment that i don't want to break or on my body that i don't want to break okay so that is the story behind eclipses now i'm not suggesting because i know some people like to you know have their gatherings for eclipses and that sort of thing i would just suggest that you be very very mindful especially if you have something near 21 degrees libra or 21 degrees aries which is opposite i mean really or even 21 degrees capricorn or cancer which is over here uh if they're if you've got something at 21 degrees aquarius or gemini which is my face is covering up the sign of gemini let's move me down a little bit here this is the sign of gemini there's a symbol for gemini so if you've got something near 21 degrees gemini or libra it might not it, it might actually be a, a, a very nice transit for you um but there's that personally what i like to do when we have an eclipse is i like to stay in my house or just wherever i am feeling comfortable i don't want to be outside um i certainly don't want to be observing the eclipse that sort of thing um and also for those of you who like to harvest your own spring water which i am certainly on board with you with that one uh it is not recommended to harvest your spring water or really anything it's not a good idea to be out harvesting your you know your vegetables or whatever from your garden at the time of an eclipse, it's also not recommended to be taking some kind of medicine right at the time of an eclipse. Like not even, you know, like myself, you can probably see, I got a whole mess of tinctures back there. I brought one of the tinctures up here. I wouldn't be taking a tincture at the exact moment of an eclipse or really I would wait at least like a couple hours before a couple hours um, after the eclipse. Okay, so there's that. And also be thinking about this as well. This but for some people, this again, this is in the sign of partnerships. For some people, this might be taking a partnership away from you. Okay. All right. Now let's also talk about Mercury because Mercury is also going through Libra. So here's Mercury, who's also fairly close to this uh this new moon and this eclipse. Okay, that might be why well, I'm feeling a little extra chatty. Uh, because this Mercury, again, Mercury has so much to do with our mental function. Mercury is how we receive information. Mercury files that information somewhere into our consciousness and then will find it for us when we're ready to communicate it. So mental function might be like kind of extra strong, but it's during the time of this eclipse and this uh, new moon, but also be thinking it's also in the sign of Libra, I do this because Libra is like, let's make sense of this. Let's be logical about this. Let's be fair about this. You know, and as a collective, like I said, this South Node is going to the sign of Libra all the way until January of 2025. Libra is the sign of justice. This is a little unnerving. We got an election coming up next year. And it is, to me, I feel like a little bit, this is it's just wild energy. The, the, the drain point is going through the sign of justice while we're having an election. We got the North Node going through the sign of aggression while we're having elections. So it's very, very interesting energy. Okay, now let's move on to Venus up here going through the sign of Virgo. Okay, so Venus, Libra's ruler. Okay, so she's important in this new moon. Uh, Venus, again, she's the influencer of love and romance and harmony and beauty and art okay she, venus can represent any 
female in our life except for mother the moon represents mother okay a sister a daughter a best friend who's a female that's what venus represents now she, <laughs> she does struggle a little bit in the sign of virgo the reason there's beautiful things about this uh venus in virgo virgo it's really like the sign of being of service. I notice a lot of people who have Venus in Virgo in their natal chart, they like to be of service to their partner. They're like, oh, I'll wash the dishes tonight, honey, that sort of thing. Or I'll stop and, you know, bring home food for us to have for dinner, that sort of thing. Uh, but Virgo is highly intellectual. And, and Virgo is one who pays very close attention to detail, okay? And Venus just wants to be romantic. In fact, some people who have their Venus and Virgo in their natal chart could be a little bit picky <laughs> about a potential romantic partner. They're like, well, I don't know. His neck is too short or something weird like that because <laughs> Venus and Virgo can be a little bit picky, but it's also a lovely energy, again, for being of service. And a lot of times when people have Venus and Virgo, they tend to take very good care of their health. Not always, but some, not often. Okay, so Venus going through Virgo. Well, well, the sign of Libra has got the drain point going through it and we got a new moon going on. There's a lot of energy going on around relationships. And then we've got poor debilitated Venus going through the sign of Virgo. But this is overall, again, this could be really nice for things in your own natal chart. If your sun is near five degrees Virgo, you got Venus sitting on your sun and she's influencing some love and beauty into your life. Okay, let's see, where should we go next? Let's, let's talk about Mars. So Mars will have just entered the sign of Scorpio. Woo. Okay, so Mars is a one of Scorpio's rulers. So Mars works very comfortably here. Mars is the influencer of aggression. Okay. As I was talking about, Aries is kind of like the sign of aggression. Well, that's because Mars is his Aries ruler. So Mars, if you look at the glyph for Mars, it's like that because he's trying to penetrate everything. Mars is aggressive and dominant, rules our muscles and our adrenal glands, our physical drive, like our willpower has a lot to do with our physical willpower to go do what we got to do. A lot of people have very strong Mars in their natal chart. Like they're the people who get up at six in the morning to get to the gym and, you know, use their muscles and their adrenals and that sort of thing. So that's Mars's influence. And Scorpio is like our spiritual willpower. Okay. Scorpio is a very, very intense energy. Scorpio is very strongly associated with our sexual energy. In fact, the sign of Scorpio even rules the genitalia. And Mars also influences, you know, genitalia, okay? They both do. And so this is like, whoa. And when Mars enters into Scorpio, it's just at one degrees. When anything is at one degrees, it's, it's extra strong. So this is like, okay, very, very, if you've got anything in your natal chart, near one degree Scorpio, you might be extra revved up, not necessarily just only talking about sexual energy. This really could be anything. This could be you all of a sudden got this major drive to go on a strong spiritual journey. Again, the sign of Scorpio can be very, very strongly associated with spiritual transformation, which is almost like it's, it just doesn't suit it. It doesn't, it's like, that's, there's so much power that comes in with Mars in Scorpio. People who have Mars in Scorpio in their natal chart tend to be very, very strong people. Of course, there's things that can counteract this, but for the most part, that's a very like strong, powerful energy. Whether we're talking about sexual energy or not, people with Mars in Scorpio can, can kind of even lash out the sign of Scorpio. There's a reason why it's most commonly represented by the scorpion, the scorpion that is a lethal pinch, okay? So Mars going through Scorpio is revving things up for sure. It's also really, really interesting that we've got Venus in Virgo, okay? Which is kind of um, almost a little bit, uh, I'm just gonna say it, almost a little bit prudish, okay? The sign of Virgo is actually represented by the Virgin. Okay, so it's almost a little bit prudish, but then we've got Mars and Scorpio. So it's an interesting blend of energies. In fact, they'll be making what we call a sextile aspect, this green line that goes from here to here. That actually can create some opportunistic stuff going on, especially if this is hitting stuff in your chart. Okay, there could be, there could it could, it could be quite romantic if I'm being totally honest. But again, everything that I mentioned here is going to depend. I, I try to focus mostly on the collective, but I also try to point out, hey, if you got something near this degree in your chart, check it out. Uh, see how you feel. See what's going on here. Um, but for the most part, when we're talking about the chart for the collective, it is very difficult to 
um, have this apply to every single person because it just depends on what's a going on in their natal chart and all like that. But a lot of this has to do with their own human free will as well. Okay, let's talk about Pluto next because Pluto will have just gone stationary. I think on the sixth. Pluto goes stationary, was in retrograde. Okay, when anything, especially Pluto and Uranus too, those guys are very, very powerful when they're going through retrograde. And then all of a sudden, it's like they're moving through retrograde and all of a sudden they slow down the brakes like, and it's, then they go stationary. And there's a lot of force that comes through. Okay, Pluto, as I was just talking about that sign of Scorpio is super, super powerful and it's ruled by Mars. Well, it's also ruled by Pluto. That's why Scorpio is so powerful because it's ruled by Mars and then Pluto. Pluto is the, the ruler of the underworld. Pluto rules powerful, powerful transformational processes, spiritual willpower. Okay. That's where Scorpio gets that from is from Pluto. A lot of times if somebody's having like a super intense Pluto transit, like Pluto's going over their sun or, or their Mercury or something like that, they suddenly have willpower to quit some terrible habit they've had all their life. You know, that's because Pluto influences that the power within us to do that, but he can also be very destructive as well. Uh, but so Pluto's really weak, working very forcefully here. Another thing to mention, so we can see Pluto's at 27 degrees Capricorn in 54 minutes. Now in the United States natal chart, you guys may have heard myself or other astrologers talk about this. We had America's Pluto return. Okay, now what Pluto, because our in the United States natal chart, Pluto is at 27 degrees Capricorn. This is if we're going off the 1776 when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Not every single astrologer uses that chart. It tends to work for me. It just makes sense to me. But anywho, in that chart, it basically, that's why it's called America's Pluto return, because Pluto's over the last 248 years, Pluto went around this thing and came back to the same place that it was when the Declaration of Independence was signed. That's a big deal. You know, Pluto takes 200, approximately 248 years to go around the Zodiac. So we don't, unless you live to be over 250 years old, people don't experience their own personal Pluto return. So when we get to witness it, you know, with something so substantial, it's prominent. And, and not only that, but in the United States natal chart, Pluto comes through the house of money, possessions, and values. Pluto also has a huge influence on things like debt. Okay. So there's something really like basically what Pluto did is it came up the Pluto up in the sky, transiting Pluto came up, poop went right on over the United States Pluto, and then has retrograded back. It's going, and actually, it's going to get really close. I think, uh, I think that the United States is at 16 minutes, this is at 54 minutes. So it's really, really close to going exactly right back over the Pluto, but it's it's not quite, but this will be the last time in our lifetimes, anybody who's watching this, again, unless you have an incredible <laughs> ability to live over 250 years or whatever, um, this will be the last time we'll experience the America's Pluto return. It's basically happened three times. Pluto went forward over America's Pluto, retrograded back, moved forward, retrograded back. And now this is the last time this will happen. I do think that there's going to be something major that happens, not necessarily crazy major, but I do think that there's going to be something that involves just putting the United States in even more debt, which is, you know, I, I, the whole thing is just so ridiculous and absurd to me. Um, I just don't understand how anybody could think we can pull ourselves out. Was it like three trillion dollars we're in debt or something like that? It's just, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, but something very well could happen with that. Whew. Okay. Now, enough of that. Oh, I also wanted to mention this. So Pluto, as I've told you guys many times before, Pluto is squaring. Here's the south node. Here's the north node. Pluto's squaring these guys, which is intense energy, okay? Uh, the creates like a blockage, creates internal tensions. Uh, but Pluto really, P Pluto's ultimate goal is to flush things out, to flush them out, to make room for a more powerful new beginning, okay? When there's this square, the nodes, all right, north node is where celestial energy comes in. South node is where celestial energy goes out. So between those nodes is this square to Pluto, which is like, Pluto's like, yes, let me take what's, you know, not serving you. I'm going to take it. I'm going to flush it out. I'm going to let it go. 
do that south node. This is very, very powerful. That that square is going on. I think it's like another six months or so, something along the maybe maybe three or four months, but it's been going on for a while. But moreover, Pluto is also squaring Mars. So we got the influence of our physical drive and our muscles and our adrenal glands squaring, creating this like internal tension with Pluto, the ruler of our physical, I mean, our, sorry, our spiritual drive and our psyche, like that's kind of gnarly. Um, but it's also, it's meant to be. There's probably just a lot of intensities going on. There's a lot of really intense energies going on solely based off of these aspects here. Okay, where should we go next? Let's go on down here to Saturn and we'll be at zero degrees Pisces again. And okay, so first of all, and also trining Mars. Wow. Okay. So Saturn is rigid. Saturn brings the discipline and the responsibilities. Going through the sign of Pisces, this is, in my opinion, this is like spiritual responsibilities. Okay. This Pisces is really the sign of spirituality and mysticism and psychic capabilities and that sort of thing. Uh, things like metaphysics, very Pisces is the like the sign that's most detached from this physical realm. Well, Saturn is like, okay, Pisces, snap or bring it together here, like basically trying to bring a little bit of rigidness. I actually know a lot of people who have a, a, a heavy dose of Pisces energy in their natal chart, like Pisces risings, Venus and Pisces. A lot of people with Pisces energy in their natal chart are especially like the early degrees of Pisces because basically Saturn entered into Pisces in March, went all the way up to eight degrees Pisces and then retrograded all the way back to zero degrees Pisces. And now he's going to move forward again. I forget when Saturn moves forward. I could look it up, but that'll take too long. Um, not too much longer. I think, oh gosh, I think it might be even later on this month or in November or something like that. But regardless, it, it don't matter too much. Zero degrees is where uh saturn is ret retrograding to now when he moves forward again it's it's like basically this saturnian energy is saying you need to be disciplined with your spiritual practices you need to be you know going in to practice your own spiritual health in fact the sign of pisces in a strange way can even be associated with things that like mental health, not, it's not clear. It's not necessarily totally mental health, but rather spiritual practices that can better your mental health. Okay. Not everybody on earth wants to be involved in, you know, working with gemstones and tarot cards and, you know, all the spiritual stuff in some way, shape or form, any kind of practice that brings a little faith into your life. And Saturn's kind of going, Hey, let's, Let's be serious about this. So that's where I was going with that. People who've got that Pisces energy, who if you've got something strong between zero and eight degrees Pisces, you've already been hit with this and you're going to get hit with it again as Saturn moves forward. Like, okay, it's time to be serious about this. It's time to, you know, Saturn lays down the rules. Okay, so there's that. And not only that, but Saturn is training Mars, which is actually, in my opinion, for this transit, probably a good thing. Saturn and Mars are considered the malefics, okay? They're they're the they can create troubles in our life, really. I mean, really anything can. But Saturn, again, he's rigid. He constricts, brings limitations, brings in the responsibilities. And Mars over here, Mars likes to start a war. Okay, Mars likes to, the aggressor again. But they're actually harmonizing together. So we've got the two malefics actually kind of getting along during this eclipse, which could definitely be a good thing. Okay, let's see here. Where should we go next? Well, let's talk about Neptune and Pisces. Real brief, real briefly here, because uh, this is a very long transit. You guys probably, I don't want to get repetitive with my videos. So Neptune is Pisces ruler, at least one of Pisces rulers, okay? Neptune is what makes Pisces so dreamy and mystical. Neptune breaks down the psychic boundaries. The sign of Pisces is very strongly associated with psychic powers. And a lot of that comes from the fact that Neptune rules it okay and i'm not just talking about because neptune is in pisces like every single zodiac sign is ruled by either one or two celestial bodies okay so neptune <clears throat> is one of pisces rulers and that's what makes pisces very mystical neptune is um 
has a very big influence on basically putting holes in our psychic boundaries. The sign of Pisces tends to be very poor at having boundaries, okay? They let people in unintentionally and they let people's energies come in unintentionally, which sometimes can be a beautiful thing, but certainly not always. Well, Neptune going through Pisces, he's in his own home, so he gets to work comfortably here. This is beautiful for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people's intuitions are being heightened wildly. A lot of people are, you know, this is playing a big role in people, so many people, people I never would have imagined all of a sudden, you know, who were like working their little tech job at Google and, or whatever, or Apple or something like that. And all of a sudden they're, you know, they're reaching out to me like, Aaron, I'm, I'm having these really, really spiritual experiences. And, you know, can you give me a little guidance here? That sort of thing. I do feel strongly that a lot of that, because a lot of them have something near 25 degrees Pisces and Neptune is beaming onto it. Okay. So Neptune going through Pisces is beaming onto it, but it's also so dreamy, so mystical that it's the little delusional. Okay. People are being tricked. People are being falling for things that are not real with Neptune going through Pisces. Again, there's literally pros and cons to everything in astrology. There's always going to be wonderful things I can say about a certain planet aspect house, whatever. Uh, but then there's also, there's going to be things that can be really tough about every, every single placement. Okay. So there's that, but that's kind of why I like Saturn, when Saturn entered into Pisces last March, uh, of course, uh, cause I am a Pisces. Okay. So of course I was like, oh no, Pisces, here we go. Saturn, here we come. Cause generally speaking, when some Saturn enters into your sun sign, it's not always the most wonderful transit. Saturn can be pretty cruel to people actually. Um, but you know, I'm thinking to myself, this is actually probably a really good thing because Saturn brings the rigidness and Neptune might need that because Neptune's going like all woo through the sign of Pisces. Okay, enough of that. Chiron going through Aries. You guys know about this. Okay, and not only that, but Chiron's opposing these guys, opposing this, this new moon, exactly opposing uh Mercury up here is at 17 degrees Libra. Chiron's at 17 degrees Aries. Again, Aries and Libra are opposite each other. Chiron influences <sighs> healing. Okay, this is the wounded healer going through the sign of self. Let's heal ourselves. Let's see, Chiron's going through Aries. I believe it's all the way till end of 2025. It might be 2026, but regardless, uh, we've got the next at least few years or at least a couple years to work on healing ourselves. And I kind of feel like this opposition might be, it's the... This could be really good for some people. It could be really good for some people. It could not be so great, but it's kind of like, hey, new moon, Mercury's right opposite Chiron, the mental function beaming into this guy that wants us to heal ourselves going through the sign of Aries. And then we've also got the new be new beginnings to, to move forward with that. I know a lot of you are already really doing beautiful things to heal yourselves from trauma, to heal yourselves from physical ailments, to whatever it is. I know so many, I mean, granted, I'm in a position, uh, you know, my career is uh, working with people and, and helping them through these sorts of things. Um, and so of course I come across a lot of people like that, but I still feel like so, and hallelujah for that. So many people are working on healing themselves. In fact, Chiron was discovered in 1977. And that's a, like exactly when all these he, like, you know, healing modalities started coming, people are talking about, hey, you know, we can meditate, we can take these certain herbs for this, we can, you know, have all kinds of practices to help um, heal ourselves like holistically, that sort of thing. It's very Chiron energy, especially again, going through the sign of self, Aries. All right, North Node coming through the sign of Aries, coming in hot. In fact, so it's October 28th, we're gonna have a lunar eclipse in the sign of Aries. That's gonna be the North Node coming in like kind of ferociously okay so there's that now all right let's go on, let's go to jupiter next so jupiter the great expander okay jupiter is the one who anything he touches he he expands it he generally jupiter is i mean he's a great benefic jupiter generally brings luck abundance wisdom philosophy long distance travel like all things wonderful right uh but Jupiter can also, if you've got something harsh going on in your chart that, that Jupiter is hitting, he can just overall make that a bigger deal. Okay. So for some people, let's say you've got your sun near uh, 13 degrees Taurus, Jupiter's at 13 degrees Taurus and in retrograde. 
for some people, like again, near 13 degrees Taurus, it for some people it can be like, oh my gosh, I won the lottery, or oh my gosh, all of a sudden I got a free trip to fly all the way overseas, or oh my gosh, I just got hit with this incredible amount of knowledge. In fact, I just I was talking to a friend who's got uh his son is in Taurus and he's been receiving wild amounts of like gold, not necessarily like physical gold, but gold information from helping his friend it, learning through some books that, and and just information that his friend had written down in a, a long story short here. That philosophy, that wisdom just pouring in through that Jupiterian energy, but it can also be aggressive. Okay. Jupiter is Thor in Norse mythology, like with the hammer can be aggressive. Jupiter can definitely be aggressive, but at the same time, for a lot of people, if you got strong Taurus energy, it, it, anything, your Mercury, Venus, whatever, near 13 degrees Taurus, Jupiter really uh, just making that area of your life overall a bigger deal. And then furthermore, we got Uranus up here. Uranus brings the abrupt changes. Uranus is like, well, that's not working anymore. Let's get rid of that. Like abruptly. Okay. Uranus is spasmatic, electrical, like very zappy. I mean, every time I talk about Uranus, I almost feel like electricity is going through my body. Um, so there's also this very abrupt energy going through the sign of Taurus as well. And in fact, next year, Jupiter and Uranus are going to be in the same spot. Woo. Okay. The sign of Taurus also has a lot to do with finances, money. Okay. That's going to be an interesting transit. I, I personally, I'm, I'm just waiting for something to happen with the digital currencies. It just makes so much sense with Uranus. I think Uranus is going through Taurus. I think that one's all the way to the beginning of 2026. If not, again, it's the end of 2025. We've got at least another couple more years of Uranus going through Taurus. And Uranus brings the revolutionary changes to the energy of the zodiac sign that it's transiting through. So Taurus Again, very strongly associated with money and material possessions and values. And again, we got Jupiter going through there. So it's like, like big, big changes going on. Uh, but also, so Uranus is considered very debilitated. In fact, it's considered in its fall in the sign of Taurus. And the reason for that is because Uranus is electrical. Zzz, okay. Taurus is the fixed earth sign that just wants to be stable and grounded and steady, okay? It's like, when I say fixed, I'm talking about total fixed energy, doesn't want to move, okay? And it's in the element of earth. And so Uranus doesn't get to quite zap us as hard as he would like to in the sign of Taurus. But it's also like, I kind of feel like the, the benefits to this is that at least that Taurus energy is kind of grounding out some of Uranus's electrical energies. And in fact, next up will be Uranus going through sign of Gemini, which is, pff, that's going to be wild too. I think there's going to be all kinds of m seriously massive changes going on with our, the way we utilize technology uh, for communication. I think when Uranus enters in that sign of Gemini, there's going to be some massive changes, but again, that's not still not for another couple of years. Okay, did I cover everything I wanted to hear? I think I did. I hope I made sense of everything for you guys. So let's move on and talk about body parts. Okay, so Libra rules. Basically, again, it's the sign that's represented by the scales. It has a lot to do with balance. It rules over the kidneys, okay? the And not only that, but the ovaries, like hormonal balances. Even the sign of Libra is actually has a big influence on all the balances in the body, hormonal balances, but also even um, like alkaline acidic balances, that sort of thing. Obviously, Libra is very important part. It, it just has so much to do with our overall health. Okay. So with that said, these parts of our body become more sensitive when the moon transits to the sign of Libra, especially if you've got something prominent in that, especially near 21 degrees Libra. So with that said, I always like to just put a little give a little extra care to these parts of our body. So first of all, kidneys, a sort of parsley. Parsley is like so basic. You could buy it at any store, right? Preferably organic, non-GMO parsley. Ultimately, you want homegrown parsley. But parsley detoxifies the kidneys gently, but also powerfully, okay? So detoxifying the kidneys. I also really, really like activated charcoal. Yeah, some of you have seen, I made a video so many years ago 
about activated charcoal. I still, I don't take it every single day anymore, but I did when I was going through a major, major like medical crisis. I was detox, activated charcoal just pulls things out. And that also can pull things out of the kidneys. I take it at least two to three, maybe even sometimes four days a week at this point, activated charcoal. But anything that will detoxify the kidneys. And another one I was thinking about, chansa piedra can also be really good for um, breaking down kidney stones. Okay, the, the chansa piedra actually means the stone crusher. So, you know, this could be a good time for doing that. But again, be gentle with yourself. If you have kidney problems, this is so interesting because I've got something in my natal chart that really it, it it's it can produce very toxic kidneys and boy oh boy have I felt it I'm not gonna have 45 years old now I mean I've been feeling that so in fact I felt like I, I remember an experience when I was in high school the first time I ever had I thought I was having back pain but I, I know now that it was my kidneys um and so I really am somebody who kind of has to just take a little extra care of our kidneys. And honestly, we're living in a world today where all of us should. We're exposed to so much toxicity. Probably all of our kidneys and livers are on overdrive. But regardless, detoxifying this stuff. Parsley, again, chanspiedra, if you're dealing with like stone sort of thing, I like activated charcoal. Okay, there's a million things you can do. Just do a little research on it. But again, be very careful with yourself. Be very mindful with yourself because yes, this might be a good time to do a little gentle work with our kidneys, but they they are more sensitive. Okay. And a lot of people do have major kidney damage. So also goldenrod can help to kind of, um, uh, like almost help regenerate or, or, or just help take care of the kidney tissue. Get goldenrod in the tincture is really, really good, really good. And by the way, I'm not a doctor. I am not offering you any kind of medical advice whatsoever. What I am talking about here are things that I've experienced for myself, learning from all my wonderful teachers over the years, nutritionists, medical astrologers, again, Judith Hill, the ultimate medical astrologer. I, personally, I think she's probably the, the top number one medical astrologer that's alive today. Learned a lot from her. Okay, all these things that I've learned, and I like to share them with you guys, but I'm not trying to offer you any kind of medical advice, okay? You got to be very, very mindful with yourself, very careful with yourself. And of course, if you're doing anything heavy, you should always check in with your healthcare practitioner. Okay, so there's that. Kidneys, what else did I want to mention? I wanted to mention, uh, let me think about this. Oh, hormones, keeping hormones in balance. Uh, personally, I really like ashwagandha. Ashwagandha can be really, really good for balancing hormones for males and females. And I feel like there was one more I was going to mention. Oh, Libra also rules the lumbar. Okay, a lot of people have got, like I'm saying, Pluto and Libra conjunct their sun or something like that can deal with lumbar issues. Something called, um, what is it? Royal fern. Royal fern can be really good for lumbar pain. Okay, so there's that. Oh, I also brought out the Don Kwai. Don Kwai can also, this is from my friend Catherine who made all these wonderful tinctures, um, can also be really good for hormone balance. But keep in mind, guys, that everybody's different. Like everybody's hormones are not all the same. So it's like, it depends on, you know, you might be high in estrogen or whatever it is. You might be too high in testosterone. So just, you know, just be mindful, be careful with yourself. Things like ashwagandha are kind of like all around good for most people. Okay. Now let's see gemstones. Let's go there. So the dedicated zodiacal birthstone for the sign of Libra is opal. So I did put my opal on today. This is a white opal that the camera is refusing to pick up. Uh, but of course there's, there's black opal. Um, opal can be really good for bringing balance into our life. It's not only that it's a beautiful stone. I can't really think of something in a natal chart that would be bad for people to wear opal. For the most part, I do think opal is pretty a, a safe, safe stone for everybody. If you guys have heard me say it a million times before, not every stone is good for everybody, especially the really, really powerful ones. Okay. Like blue sapphire, you might want to be a little bit careful with blue sapphire. It's a perfect stone for some people it can bring massive benefits into their life. But for some people, it might create some blockages. Okay. Uh, but opal, I feel like is a pretty good stone for pretty much anybody. Now also, since this is an eclipse, I pulled out some very protective stones. And these specific stones do resonate very, very well with the sign of Libra. Let's pull out both the pieces of kyanite here. You guys have seen me pull out this blue kyanite a lot over this past year. So I, like I said, I've been working with this a lot lately. So black kyanite and blue kyanite, but blue kyanite, very, very protective stones. And when we're having an eclipse, 
it's not a bad idea to have some very protective stones around us. I mean, honestly, I'll leave a list as usual in the description below about, you know, maybe 20 stones that resonate well with the sign of Libra. Like this right here is citrine, which citrine also resonates very, very well with the sign of Libra, but it's not necessarily the most protective stone. Okay. Let's say if you got Libra in your second house, your house of money, you might want to incorporate some citrine. Citrine can actually bring in, um, you know, mm, good finances. Okay. Citrine can be good for that. So there's all kinds of stones. I'm just pulling out the ones that I'll be working with here. But anything protective, you don't have any blue kind of because these do very specifically resonate well, especially the blue. Like this is kind of a Libra ish color, okay? That like light, sort of softer color. But um, this also can be very good for bringing a little, like cooling things down. If you got a lot of Mars energy going on, that square that's going on between Pluto and Mars, this lighter blue color can bring some softening to that. This is just straight up protection right here, that kyanite, black kyanite. Uh, tourmaline, really any color tourmaline. Do I have my green one here? This one's, you can't really see the, oh, you can kind of see it. This is green tourmaline, dark dark green tourmaline. tourmaline. This is black tourmaline. Um, really any kind of tourmaline, for the most part, resonates well with the sign of Libra and also very, very protective stones, okay? So there's that. You know, you can always, if you want to amplify something, let's say everything's golden in your life. I mean, you're just on top of the world right now then, you know, I would still encourage you to use some kind of protective stone, um, but you might also feel comfortable with using something that's like a clear crystal quartz or the citrine that's is much more clear. That's going to be an amplifier for things in your life. Although I do, again, recommend the protective stones just overall for this transit. Okay, you guys, I think I covered everything. If you would like to schedule an astrology reading, please visit Aaron wageastrology.com. You can schedule straight through my website and keep in mind that this eclipse energy, I should have mentioned this way earlier. So I probably lost some of you at this point, but this most things don't happen on the day of an eclipse. So they certainly can. They absolutely, especially if you're out there exposing yourself to the eclipse, you might be feeling anxiety or something, you know, something could go weird, but they don't always really usually happen on the day of an eclipse. It's usually within two weeks before the eclipse, two weeks after the eclipse, or, but then keep in mind, we've got another lunar eclipse coming up two weeks after this eclipse. So then two weeks following that eclipse. Okay. But something also could happen potentially um, 180 days after an eclipse or approximately 90 days after an eclipse. That has to do with aspects in the chart. I should have showed you that when I pulled the chart up. So keep that in mind. Be mindful of where that sign of Libra comes through your natal chart. If you've got anything near 21 degrees Libra or again, a 21 degrees around 21 degrees Gemini or Aquarius, this might be a little bit more of a harmonious one for you. But if you've got anything near, near 21 degrees Aries or Cancer or Capricorn, this is probably a pretty powerful uh, transit for you. So again, if you want to dive deeper into this and understand, you know, specifically how this manifests for you, again, schedule straight through my website, erinwageastrology.com. I do hope to hear from some of you and until next time, namaste to all of you.